Good afternoon and welcome to 391 at San Antonio Road for the celebration of the birth of Silicon Valley. Before we start, a uh, very important announcement. Uh, this is, as you can see, this place is still under construction. The nearest finished bathroom is out these doors to your left. You'll cross the driveway and there'll be a sign that'll direct you to the left. It's in the next building and there'll be a security guard that will open the bathrooms as needed. <laughs> We're very pleased to see such a great turnout for this event. Uh, we really didn't know what to expect, but we're very pleased and gratified for the response. Uh, I am Andy Romans. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. Staging this afternoon events has been a cooperative effort by the developer, Merwin Geyer Partner, Computer History Museum, SEMI, IEEE, and some ex-Shockley employees. I think we have a very interesting and very, very informative program put together for you. And yes, indeed, I did work at this site some 60 years ago. It wasn't quite here. It was a little bit over that way. I worked there from 58 to 1962, and I have uh, participated on what we call the advisory committee for this project since 2013, I believe. First of all, I'd like to introduce to you Lenny Siegel, the mayor of Mountain View, who will say a few welcoming words, because after all, this is Mountain View. Lenny? Good afternoon. Uh, last year I gave a talk to a, a delegation vi visiting from Guangzhou, China, and I talked about the Silicon Va Valley family tree, which Professor Gibbons is going to talk in more detail about soon. And what was interesting was how, when I was all done, some of the Americans in the room came up to me and said, I didn't know anything about that. Now looking around here, I'm sure there are people who, were, who had the Silicon Valley family tree in their DNA, but uh, this is something that is an important part of our history because it guides what we do today. I used to write about the history of Silicon Valley 50 years ago when there wasn't as much history. And I remember attending a conference uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, and one of the speakers was Robert Noyce, founder of Fairchild Intel. And someone asked why was Silicon Valley here, and he said, well, it's because Bill Shockley's mother lived here. <laughs> And I argued with him because I knew that the, the investment climate, the intellectual climate uh, that made Silicon Valley what it was, was started at Stanford primarily by provost and dean of engineering, Frederick Terman. Now back in the day, I was a nemesis of his because I thought he was too dependent on the defense department. But the kind of uh, cooperation between industry and government and the university that, that was Stanford to me made Silicon Valley what it was. Otherwise, Silicon Valley would be in Lubbock, Texas, where at the time the largest semiconductor company in the world was located. Now this is important to us today for those of us who are in government because it's our job to maintain the climate, the environment, the quality of life that attracts smart people from all over the world to come work here. We're not only the home of, of some of the world's biggest corporations, but we're a place where Almost anybody with a good idea can start a new company. We've got the venture capital, we've got the intellectual property lawyers, we've got all kinds of services that you can rely on. And this is what makes Silicon Valley what it is. So when you think about the Silicon Valley family tree and how Shockley begat Fairchild and Fairchild begat many of the other companies, that's still happening today. Mountain View has somewhere around 20 autonomous vehicle companies. It's not because because this is the best place in the world to drive autonomous vehicles. I worry when they go down my street. It's because we have the investment climate and the quality of life that attracts people here. 
And once again, it's our job in government to make sure that we have the housing and transportation and that quality of life that will continue to attract people and to enable not only the big companies to survive and continue and grow, but for startups, because that's what Silicon Valley has always been all about. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. The work that was done at this site laid foundation, as was mentioned earlier, for the semiconductor industry in this valley. Its historical significance was duly noted by the developer Merlin of the village at San Antonio Center, I believe. Merlin Geyer Partners, and specifically the managing director for the project, uh, Dave Geyser. You can see the results today. Newly commissioned public sculptures, Terry. Newly commissioned public sculptures, uh, some plaques on San Antonio Road, uh, listing some of the achievements and some of the milestones in this valley. And you will have a chance to all see all of these at the end of this program. Uh, as a reminder of this project, uh, Dave, and an appreciation for your dedication to this project. Uh, Terence, can you help me out here? We would uh, <clears throat> like to present you with a small memento. Maybe it's not so small, but it is a memento that would certainly remind you of this project that you were associated with. Geyser. I'm the Managing Director of Design and Construction for Malone Geyer Partners. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to Phase 2 um, of the San Antonio Village. Um, this uh, project, just to set the stage and kind of tell you where you are, um, Phase 2 of our project uh, really began around 2013 with the ending of Phase 1, um, but encompasses about 403,000 square feet of office building. It will soon be the home to Facebook. A 10-screen luxury theater, which is actually sits above you, which is opening here in October. It's also the home to, uh, soon to be the home to Hyatt Centric uh, Hotel, which will be opening a 167 room a boutique hotel sometime in early 2019. And another 150,000 square feet of retail and commercial space that we're working on leasing, which unfortunately has been held back by the somewhat uh, delay of the, the opening of the, the office and the uh, hotel. I kind of want to set the stage a little bit for, for the early stages and how we got started here. Uh, in, in 2013, when we were contemplating uh, the phase two, um, we were, we heard from many people in the community um, asking us what was going to be done to commemorate the historical uh, events that, that took place here. And so recognize the, the significance uh, of what actually did happen and, and spending a lot of time learning about that ourselves, um, we assembled a committee, an advisory committee um, of experts, professionals, design experts, um, and former Shockley Lab employees, actually with Andy and, and Jock, um, to help guide us to determine what was the appropriate level of, of monumentation for, for those events. Um, some folks have come and gone from that uh, committee, um, but we work closely also with the Computer History Museum, David Laws, um, to, to help us uh, make sure that we are historically accurate and, and doing what we thought was appropriate uh, for the site. The first thing we did was actually create a mission statement, which helped guide us in our future decisions um, and which led us to the decision that what we really needed was a fantastic um, uh, art piece or centerpiece for the project, which led us to a design competition in the summer of 2013. Um, we were moved right away by the presentation by Mary White and Vicki and Joe Soule um, with the transistor artwork that you see, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but we were also, at the same, same time, we were gravitating towards that and, and really thought they, they hit the mark. Um, we also fell in love with the silicon molecule, which you saw earlier, uh, the prototype that, that Terrence Martin uh, came up with. And, and so we were, we were torn, how, how do we incorporate all of this? And, and so 
We spent a lot of time, a lot of hours with our advisory committee meeting month after month, trying to come up with, uh, with how we incorporate all this artwork. And what we've come up with uh, after years of, of meetings and committees and, and, and trying to make that decision is the artwork that you see out here today. And, and incorporate also signage, uh, uh, graphics, of a large 391 letter symbolizing the importance of the address to the site of the community. So, so you know, again, uh, much work and time went into with the artists and, and with our advisory committee to, to really guide you know, what happened and, and how the site was transformed. Finally, after a, a couple of years of that work, we got approved through the city of, of Mountain View and working collaboratively with the planning department who was very supportive of the artwork that we were doing. And, and, and really have to give a shout out to Nancy Minifuchi, uh, one of the planners who worked with us side by side in making sure that this all worked well, was planned well together as a public space. Um, and so uh, thanks to her. Um, once we started construction in 2015, we started working with the artists on their projects and ultimately led to the construction of the, of the or installation of the artworks in last summer. And, um, and to what you will see today, and more than happy to talk more with you about that outside, and as well the artists too. So on behalf of Merlot and Bayer Partners, we're truly grateful to have had this opportunity to participate with a group of very dedicated people to help bring their vision and the vision of the entire community to fruition. So thank you again. It is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce uh, to you our keynote speaker today, Professor James Jim Gibbons from Stanford University. Jim received his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford in 1956 and has been on his faculty ever since. And as you perhaps saw earlier, he was from 1984 to 1996, he was uh, Frederick Emmons German Dean of the School of Engineering. Now, in uh, addition to his academic work, uh, Jim was a true Silicon Valley uh, pioneer, if you will. He's also an entrepreneur and started a silicon processing manufacturing company, also while serving, serving at Stanford. More importantly for today's presentation, Jim started to work as a liaison between uh, Shockley Laboratories and Stanford University back in 1957. So he was there literally from day one, well, developing while well, this whole technology and the whole semiconductor industry was, was emerging. And he will share his experiences from these early days of Silicon Valley with us today, Jim. I've chosen this title. Yeah, those of you who uh, watch the PBS NewsHour will recognize that I borrowed this title from them. <laughs> However, I do think it provides an excellent summary of the history of Shockley Laboratories. The word brief seems appropriate because Shockley Labs existed for only four years until one large market, which Shockley had hoped to capture, disappeared. And it was also spectacular because Shockley brought the people and the technology to this area that would eventually lead to the development of Silicon Valley. I also want to say a word about the phrase group resigns. Shockley kept a daily diary for most of his life. As you can see, his style, was di his style as a diarist was laconic, to say the least. When you see a phrase or a sentence that is in quotes and in red type, you will know that that was taken directly from Shockley's diary or from confirmed conversations that are referred to in his diary. Finally, I'm going to attempt to present the history in a timeline. I'm going to start that timeline in 1948. Don't worry, it'll be past. Um, <laughs> But uh, at the Bell Laboratories, where two of the critical developments that led to the formation of the Shockley Labs occurred. So, January 23rd, 1948, 
Shockley is at an Applied Physics meeting, uh, an Association of Physics uh, meeting in Chicago. It's a four-day meeting. Uh, he's kind of bored with what's going on. Beside that, he wants to work on this idea that he has, which is an extraordinary generalization of what had been invented at the Bell Labs in the form of a contact, point contact transistor. I won't go into the details, but he spent four days there generating this patent, which was one of the most extraordinary feats of imagination that I have ever seen or hope to see. But usually when somebody files a patent, the organization they're working with, will, when he files a disclosure, which is what Shockley did, the company will file for a patent. It was uh, six months before Bell Labs filed for a patent. And you might wonder why that was the case. Well, first of all, there were two other transistor patents that they had to decide who the inventors were and what shock role Shockley might have played in those. And also, uh, you have to have a description in your patent of how to build what it is you're patenting. It doesn't have to be the best way, but it's got to be a way. And Shockley wasn't sure he had that for several months. So that was one of the reasons for the delay. The next thing happens, this is now seven years later. You see there's a break in the scale there, 1948 to 49, and now it's 55 to 56. Uh, there was a lot of work that went on in those seven years in developing the technology that was necessary to build uh, silicon devices and, and germanium devices. But the one thing they were seeking was what Maury Tannenbaum did uh, on March 17th, which was announced that he had built a diffusion, uh, a um, junction transistor that was made by diffusion. You don't need to worry about that, I'll tell you later. But um, <clears throat> that, the importance of that was that it was a of, it was a process that could be uh, scaled in manufacturing. That was the first time anybody had built a transistor that was also going to be uh, drive significant manufacturing. Very important. Shockley saw that, saw the opportunity that was associated with it as only Shockley could. So, three months later, he formed Shockley Semiconductor Labs. And he's, uh, what he says is he's going to leave Bell. He's going to start a company that uh, will commercialize silicon bipolar transistors and other semiconductor devices. Four months later, he has received funding from Arnold Beckman, Beckman Instruments Corp Incorporated in Pasadena. And he promises Arnold to collect the most creative team in the world for developing and producing transistors and other semiconductor devices. He did that, as you'll see. Beckman wanted him to set up the company in Pasadena. Shockley, as has been previously said, wanted to set it up in, pa in Palo Alto because his aging mother lived at 949 Waverly Street. <laughs> this is a little uh, uh, buzz for the, for the developers here. Um, Shockley rented at Quonset Hut, 391 South San Antonio Road, 2,255 square feet at five and a half cents a square foot. <laughs> First home of Shockley Labs. There it is. Bill had his office over here in those two bays. And when he was in town, his uh, green Jaguar coupe was parked out here. So that is, as you see, Shockley Semiconductor Labs, Beckman Instruments Incorporated. So now he's got to put his team together. And he's told Beckman what he's going to do, which is, to, which is bring to this site the very best people in the world that he can find to, to work on these problems, semiconductor research. So he reads a lot of papers. He's got a big uh, set of consultants that he can talk to and so on. And finally, um, he chooses from that extensive uh, work that he'd done, Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, Jay Last, Jean Herney, Sheldon Roberts, Gene Kleiner, Rick Greenwich, and Julie Blank. That's the eight. And if he tells 
all of them each one of them we are going to focus focus first on making silicon bipolar transistors if you'd done that there wouldn't have been a fair child but Shockley however thorough his investigation was the one place where he lacked confidence in himself was in people's IQ he wanted to know precisely what their IQ was well you know I don't know how well you can measure IQ anyway but uh, uh, he insisted that this group of people take extensive IQ tests and personality tests Bob uh, Noyce was in Philadelphia at the time, Gordon Moore was in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. They went to New York to take, to take these tests, and the results of the tests were very bright, but will never make very good managers. <laughs> so, February 14, San Francisco, Beckman and Shockley hold a news conference in, uh, to officially announce their plans to form a transistor manufacturing company. Team assembles in April 1956 to begin work on the technology for building silicon bipolar transistors. They don't have an equipment supply chain, so they have to build everything that they uh, want to use. Fall of 1956, Shockley makes a significant uh, judgment. One might say error, but anyway, a judgment. He had learned at Bell Labs, he kept very, very close connection to Bell Labs throughout. He learned there that they were expecting to use a thing called a four-layer diode as a switch, a cross-point switch in a telephone system. So you have a telephone line going this way and you're on it and your friend is on this line and when they cross in the telephone exchange, you need to make a connection there so that you can talk to your friend. That's what this device would do. So, Noyce and Moore say, no, we don't want to change the four-layer diode now. We'll do that later. First, we'll keep focusing on what you said you wanted to focus on, which was the silicon bipolar. Persistent difficulties in building the four-layer diode led Shockley to berate individual employees in open meetings. Not a good thing. Management 101. <laughs> Junction technology team for reasons that uh, are still in the fog a little bit, continued to develop the basic technology that, were needed, that was needed to build silicon devices. Shockley, November 1st, 1956, wins the Nobel Prize in Physics, together with uh, John Bardeen and, and uh, Walter Bratton for inventing the point contact transistor. Shockley invites his team to uh, a champagne brunch at Ricky's, that tells you how old it is, right? Um, in uh, the next day, and I'll just uh, tell you who these guys are. This is Gene Kleiner, that's Gordon Moore, that's Sheldon Roberts, that's Big uh, Jones, that's Shockley, I never saw him happier than this in my life. <laughs> that's Smoot Horsley, that's Jean Hernie, that's Julie Blank, that's Bob Noyce, that's Leo Valdez, Dick Greenwich and Jay Last. That's the, that's the team. Extraordinary individuals. Five weeks later, the team is writing a letter to Arnold Beckman uh, to describe the intolerable working environment at Shockley Civic Center. The last sentence of that letter I've quoted, please help us immediately. And it's signed by senior members of the technical team. So Beckman comes up two days later, meets with the team. Here's the team's proposal. We're going to focus on silicon bipolar only. We'll appoint a new manager, not Shockley. Shockley uh, will take a position at Stanford. Now, Stanford didn't know anything about this, right? This is just a team. <laughs> this is a team saying, this is what we want. Um, Serves, and he can serve as a technical advisor to the company. Beckman appears to agree, but uh, after discussion with Shockley, he makes no change. Now we're going to switch. Now we're at the first of 1957, January and February. John Linville, then an electrical engineering faculty member at Stanford, uh, talks to Shockley 
about what the possible impact of semiconductor electronics technology would be on the education of electrician doctoral students. Shockley's position in those discussions was, you need to have a lab where students can build devices as part of their PhD research program. Shockley, when Linville says, yeah, so how do we do that? He said, well, if you find somebody that you think can do it, apprentice them to me, then I will teach them how to do this. So uh, he offered to train a faculty member. March of 1957, Gordon Moore repeats a, creates a repeatable process for fabricating really high quality silicon diodes. You have to do that before you can make a, a transistor. He believes the lab is within a few months of making a transistor. He was right. They're not going to spend the next few months trying to make a transistor for reasons that will be apparent shortly, but he was right. They could have had that done before the end of 1957. Shockley is now 75% of the way through his funding from Peckman, and he moves Jay Last, Sean Herney, and um, Sheldon Roberts to the Fort Laird Dowd team and puts extreme pressure on them to succeed. His concern is if he can get this thing produced in quality, at high quality and high quantity, he can be the supplier for Western Electric, uh, the, 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 the telephone uh, switchboard manufacturing company. So he's got to get this done. Linville gets a small $35,000 contract from ONR to set up a semiconductor processing lab at Stanford. Never before attempted in an electroengineering department. Electro engineering students solder stuff together, right? This is, this is toxic material that we're going to be dealing with, so it doesn't sound like double E to most people. And uh, I was offered a faculty appointment in double E with a half time appointment at Shockley, so I could learn how to build these devices and then transfer that information to Stanford. Mid May that year, uh, deterior deteriorating finances uh, at Beckman Instruments, the total corporation, uh, caused Beckman to visit the Shockley Corp and say, uh, I'd like to have you keep your expenses down. Shockley bridles at that request. This is from his notebook, from his diary. Arnold, if you don't like what we're doing here, I will find new funding and take my team somewhere else. That's with the team and everybody in the same audience. I wasn't there then. And uh, he stands up and walks out. And people are flummoxed. They don't know what to do with this. Finally, everybody you know, gets their act together, and they leave. The next day, Gordon Moore calls Beckman with the entire team hovered around the phone to hear this phone conversation to say, we're not going to follow Shockley anywhere. <laughs> Beckman, a couple days later, tells Shockley that they will not follow him, but they will stay with Beckman if Shockley goes. Shockley makes an alternate proposal to Beckman. His proposal is to include a man named Morris Hannafin, who was a, a, the CEO of a, of, a, of a Beckman facility at that time. Hannafin was a, at, had a little company called Spinco, it was an ultra centrifuge company, on uh, California Avenue in Palo Alto. Beckman again chooses Shockley over the team. I think the Nobel Prize was just so glittering that uh, Beckman should, couldn't shoot past it. Moore and company now realize that their bridges are burned and the group is going to resign individually without any plan when the opportunities arise. Um, a few weeks later, about a month later, the group meets at Gordon's house, uh, 1474 Alford Street in Los Altos. Um, they realize that between them, they possess all the expertise they need to make silicon transistors. That's a big deal. They decide to leave as a group and go to a new company that wants to build silicon bipolar transistors. They also decide 
to keep up appearances of full-time work at Shopee while they're looking for backing. <laughs> That's part of the reason that Gordon didn't actually produce the transistor uh, too fast, right? They were going to make a transistor, but it was not going to be under Shockley's roof. We knew that. Or he, they knew that. Turns out Gene's Kleiner's father uh, knew some uh, people in the banking industry in New York City, and um, they undertook to find companies that would want to employ these guys. They'd still be employed here, but uh, they would be under some corporate sponsorship, not Beckman. Uh, two people named Bud Coyle and Arthur Rock, eventually very famous venture capitalists, uh, are tasked to help them. I arrive at Shockley's uh, on the, for the first day of my apprenticeship. Uh, I take the necessary exams. <laughs> I'm told, though they don't know this, I'm told that Bob Noyce will be my circuits, my uh, device coach, Gordon Moore would be my diffusion coach, Jay Last would be my materials coach, and Vic Greenwich would be my circuits coach. Uh, I don't know any of those guys, and they don't know me, so uh, they welcome me, and uh, I have no idea that they're intending to leave in the near future. In fact, six weeks. Paul and Rock are not able to find a company that wants to employ these guys, so they suggest that why don't you just uh, start your own company, and they'd found a person named Sherman Fairchild, then the CEO of Fairchild Camera and Instrument, and also the largest uh, single shareholder of IBM stock at the time. Fairchild offered the group a $1.4 million contract for 18 months with additional funding uh, at the end of that, given success. And Fairchild himself got a, a, a very attractive buyout package for that deal. The group signed $1 bills in Rock's office in San Francisco to commemorate this event. September 18th, 1957, each member of the group goes in on his own, hands a letter of departure vision to Morris Hannafin. At the end of the day, Morris has letters of uh, departure from uh, all eight. Shockley writes in his diary, Wednesday, 18 September, group resigns. How do you do that with that uh, degree of, of uh, laconicism or whatever it is? <laughs> Pretty tough. Ah, sorry. The group, the next day, September 19, 1957, uh, the group signs the agreement to form Fairchild Semiconductor. That is what I regard as the birth notice for Silicon Valley. Beckman comes up, meets now the Fairchild Semiconductor Corporation team uh, at Shockley's new facility, and uh, he castigates the group, su suggests uh, legal action, but doesn't carry through on it. Shockley honors his promise to Stanford to uh, set up this lab. Wednesdays at Kirk's, that'll require a little explanation. <laughs> Shockley was a hamburger fan. Kirk's, now in town and country village, used to be, in 1957, it was um, where Rastrodero crosses El Camino, or turns into Charleston, out there, about Four or five, three, two or three blocks up was where Kirk's hamburgers were. Shockley went there. If you're having a lunch with Shockley, that's where you're going to lunch. So he comes around to say, Jim, I see your coaches have left. And uh, <laughs> yes, sir. So here's what we're going to do. When I'm in town, um, you and I are going to have lunch on Wednesdays. And uh, so, okay, good. And we'll talk about your lab. So my first Wednesday comes up and uh, we go off to lunch. I've got to teach my class at Stanford in the afternoon. And uh, he's, um, first thing he wants to know is not how the lab's going. What he wants to know is, how's the work you're doing for me going? So for the first 45 minutes of this hour, we're talking about uh, what I'm doing to help his company succeed. The last 15 minutes, he says, okay, now let's talk about your problems. 
So I tell him what my problem is, and he says, okay, um, I'm gonna call a man named Morgan Sparks, Bell Labs employee, uh, who was very helpful to Shockley in the early days of the transistor at Bell. I'm gonna call him. He's the right guy for you to talk to. And when we've made contact with him, my secretary, also his wife, um, will call you to let you know that it's happened. So I go teach my class, I get to my office, and there's a note for me from Emmy Shockley saying, uh, um, that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm expected to make this call. So I call up, and um, <clears throat> Shockley has described exactly what my problem is, so that uh, you know whoever he's talked to can uh, can work on my problem with me to say here's what you need to do, and. Um, also, most of the time, call me back when you've got it done. Well, we're three hours ahead of them. I say, well, you know, it might be nine o'clock your time before I get this done. I don't care, call me back. That interaction was something that only Shockley could have done. And he did it for Stanford. We could not have gotten this lab going without that. So that was a big deal from Stanford's point of view. Fairchild announces here are three things that happened in March 1958. Fairchild announced its first silicon transistor. Uh, six months after leaving Shockley, if they'd stayed under Shockley's roof, they could have done it faster. Um, two years after the formation of Shockley Labs, and um, Shockley also then proceeds and uh, uh, succeeds in producing 400, uh, 100 four-layer diodes uh, per month, per week, rather. Those are used in military applications. When I was working for Shockley, I was out traveling around trying to get these things uh, employed in various places, and a lot of them are military applications. And Stanford made its first device, six months from a cold start. We've been told, when we were uh, organizing ourselves to do this, that We'd be lucky to have it done in a year. But it was a lot easier than people thought it was going to be. So here is the Shockley lab. Um, here is the Stanford lab. Whoops, sorry. That is John Linville, who started this discussion with Shockley and uh, was responsible for bringing me on. Um, and turned out eventually to be the chairman of the uh, uh, electrical engineering department. This man is Gerald Pearson. He had invented this, the uh, silicon solar cell at Bell and uh, was thinking about coming to Stanford, but he wanted to know that we had a lab, because this is an experimental physicist we're talking about here. If you don't have a lab, they're, they're kind of gone. They're, he can build his own lab, of course, but he needs to know that the, the we've done something successfully in, in lab building. So, and um, that's me, you can't quite see, that's a, a quartz uh, boat with grooves in it, and you put wafers in those boats, in those grooves, and you push it in this diffusion furnace here, and then a dilute uh, mixture of boron trichloride is flowing over it. Boron is something you want to diffuse into the semiconductor. That's good. But what's not so good is, this is the exhaust for the boron trichloride. It goes through a hole in the roof, and on the top of that exhaust, there's a little hat. I could have poisoned the entire Stanford campus with this. Fortunately, uh, so far, we don't know that anything happens. Shockley Semiconductor, uh, by uh, July of 1959, has succeeded in getting four-layer four -layer diode production to 1,000 devices per month. There are important military applications that continue. Western Electric decides not to use this device in major telephone switching applications, and that eliminates the major market for the Shockley diode. One stroke. Beckman, a couple of years later, sells Shockley 
to clean by for $1 million. Shakti got half of that. Shakti was appointed the first Pontiac professor of engineering and Stan uh, engineering science at Stanford. And then he consulted with Cleveland until the business closed in 1968. But the business effectively was on the way down fast when Western Electric said, we're not going to use this device. Now the Fairchild, the sequel, I call it, 1959. A few critical events for Silicon Valley. January 17th, Jean Reni files a patent on the planar process, it's called. March 1959, Hernie fabricates transistors using this process. That makes possible very high volume manufacturing of semiconductors. And on October 1959, Fairchild transfers all of its transistor manufacturing to this planar process. That's a big deal. January 23rd, one week after Jean Hernie had filed his patent, Bob Noyce files a patent for the integrated circuit. What he realizes is that if Jean Reni can build one transistor in this oxidized silicon surface, then we can build two or more or three or whatever we want and put things between them to make an integrated circuit. So he made, he designed or, or invented the first practicable integrated circuit with that insight. And Jay Last was given the responsibility to develop the technology for manufacturing integrated circuits. That event, that invention, and the and the planar process invention, drove Silicon Valley for a very long time. Fairchild Camera and Instrument, seeing how successful their little startup is, uh, exercises its option to buy out the Fairchild employees. Uh, each founder got three hundred thousand bucks. That's about three million dollars in today's dollars. And there's the team. I never before or since saw them in suits, but <laughs> there they are. Whoops, sorry. Uh, I'll just run over them again. That's Gordon Moore, Sheldon Roberts, Gene Kreiner, Bob Noyce, Vic Greenwich, Julie Blank, John Ernie, Jay Last. Only Jay Last is smiling for reasons that I don't know. <laughs> Fifteen months later, Jean Ernie and Jay Last leave Fairchild. I'm calling this the eight breakup. They uh, leave to form a company called Amelco. It's a, a division of Teledyne. They have a license to manufacture um, integrated circuits for military applications only. And Fairchild continues to manufacture the circuits for commercial applications. John Ernie and, and uh, Jay Last and, and John Ernie are soon joined by um, Sheldon Roberts and Gene Kleiner. That divides the original eight into four, two groups of four. Amelco was later folded into Teletine Semiconductor. Amelco, as the first spin out from Fairchild, which itself had spun out of Shockley, um, creates a new paradigm for corporate formation stock options for everybody, and flat organizational structures. Six years later, Jean Ernie's leaving again to uh, form Union Carbide Electronics and then Intercell Semiconductor, specializing in digital watch processors. I'll be collecting all this stuff uh, shortly. But anyway, what, you wanna, what I want you to see here is that these guys don't work together as Fairchild for very long before some internal stuff and they're, they're, op they're seizing new opportunities for themselves and they leave. And then they leave that second current firm that they founded. So there's a lot of Silicon Valley in that, in that motion there that's going on. Fairchild uh, manufacturing manager Charlie Sport leaves Fairchild in 1967 to become the CEO of National Semiconductor, uh, specializing in analog integrated circuits Noyce and Moore leave Fairchild in 1968 to form Intel. The microprocessor is invented by Ted Hoff in 1970, commercialized by Federico Fugin and, and Ted Hoff and others, and the first products brought to market in 1971. Intel, as you may know, Intel uh, 
CPUs and Microsoft operating systems uh, become the major force in personal computing in the United States and around the world. 1972, Fairchild alums uh, now form two new major venture capital companies. Gene Kleiner and Tom Perkins form a company that was called Kleiner Perkins for a long time, but then eventually added two other partners, Caulfield and Byers. And Don Valentine, uh, sales VP at Fairchild and National, leaves to form Sequoia Capital. All these firms are out on 3000 Sand Hill Road, or many of them are. The two premier firms out there amongst a series of spectacular firms are Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia Capital. So here is, uh, I like to think about this as a big bang. <laughs> the creation of Silicon Valley. I'm try to collect a bunch of stuff that's happened here. And uh, when I got this uh, slide, this little, whoops, Pushing the wrong button, I'm sorry. This little button, that little dot in the middle wasn't in it. Um, so I've got to acknowledge how that got there. It actually was photoshopped in, I photoshopped it. Um, this legend down here says the size of each of those circles reflects the influence of the uh, entrepreneurs at each company based on the number of spinouts that they create. So that's what that side. So since Shockley, since Fairchild spun out of Shockley, I don't think uh, it's right to leave Shockley from this picture. So his firm failed, but there's plenty of failure in Silicon Valley. And his firm also, he hired these guys, brought them here. They did the kind of work they needed to do to build a Silicon Valley door, and then they did. So that's Fairchild. And this, um, Scale is going out here to year to 1968 to 71, and you see there's Intel and there's uh, AMD and there's uh, four phase and there's uh, I can't read them too well myself, but anyway, um, over that period of time, 40 different companies were formed. And now I want to go to Stanford to follow up on the Stanford sequel. So we built the Solid State Electronics Laboratory, as it was called. And we did basic material science, device physics, process technology for silicon devices and 3.5 compound semiconductors. One thing I want to point out here is that this is March 1958. The bipolar junction transistor was invented in 1948. So it's 10 years between when the invention occurred before Stanford is creating a laboratory to take advantage of that invention. September 1969, we formed the Integrated Circuits Laboratory at Stanford. The Integrated Circuit was now the dominant product um, in a rapidly advancing semiconductor industry. Stanford's IC lab uh, was successful in developing a lot of process modeling tools used worldwide for IC fabrication, continuing today. High power and integrated circuits, devices, and special purpose ICs. I won't go through who these faculty are, but um, anyway, they were, some of them brought here, some of them grown here to create this lab. September 1980, what's called the Center for Integrated Systems was uh, uh, brought into existence. Um, the microprocessor was by then the dominant uh, product of a still rapidly advancing semiconductor industry. The process of microprocessor was invented in 1970. This is 1980. The integrated circuit was invented in 1959. This is 1969. Ten years between the invention in industry and Stanford having a lab that's associated with that. So here's my summary of the semiconductor chapter of the history of Silicon Valley. Fairchild and the fair children realized Shockley's dream of creating a new industry based on silicon device technology. And that includes a new general paradigm for perfect formation, it's a Melco. Creation of a venture capital industry 
to help support new startups that will fuel future generations of uh, innovation. Gene Kleiner, Don Valentine. Development of a manufacturing equipment industry to serve the needs of uh, semiconductor manufacturing, including eventually what are called wafer foundries. I told you that at the beginning, the Shakti group were building their own stuff. By this time, you've got entities, uh, very large and successful entities. Um, uh, Jim Morgan uh, is, was for a long time the chairman and CEO of, of Applied Materials. They were um, among the first. And uh, um, David Lamb um, was also very successful in this. He left his company after a while. But my point is that there were some significant uh, uh, developments in, that, in the manufacturing industry. It's also true that MOS technology, as, as distinguished from bipolar transistor technology, all the diffusion stuff I've been talking about, it finally was overtaken by MOS technology. Uh, because it allowed very high density circuit designs at very low power. All in, that means the venture capital, all the MOS stuff, all the companies, uh, everything else becomes what's called the first trillion dollar startup. I guess these days they have to stand aside because Apple is now a trillion dollar startup. Shockley's 1957 proposal for Stanford leads over time to the creation of three major laboratories at Stanford in the EE department based on innovations in industry. And the faculty and the students in both electrical engineering and computer science departments at Stanford uh, are a continuing source of development and innovation as Silicon Valley grows. This is a plaque which I think is going to be unveiled around here somewhere, but it used to be in the sidewalk outside 391 when it was still a Kwanzaa hut. I'll read this to you. Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory. This site, 391 South San Antonio Road, is the former location of the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory. At this location in 1956, William Shockley started the first silicon device research and manufacturing company in the valley. The individuals that gathered to work at this site went on to form the pioneering Silicon Valley startup company, Fairchild Semiconductor Corporation, and invent the first practicable integrated circuit. The advanced research and ideas developed here led to the development of Silicon Valley, as you've seen, and later breakthroughs in the computer industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. What a composite of events that he was able to describe to us. Amazing. Next, I would like to introduce to you Ajit Monaka, who is currently the president and CEO of Semiconductor Equipment Manufacturing Institute. He was formerly the CEO of Global Foundries and, currently, and concurrently served as chairman of the Semiconductor Industry Association. Earlier, he had held senior management positions at Philips, AT&T, Microelectronics. Interestingly, he started his career at Bell Labs as well. Ajit, would you please come forward? And over the years, as Dave mentioned earlier, this project that we're working on for 10 years, SEMI has been very supportive in efforts and with their assistance and their advice in getting this thing organized, please. Thank you. Wow, I don't think anybody can top Professor Gillis. What do you say? You know, why was it? Yes. I started in Bell Labs in 1980, and I started MOS. And we heard some stories of Bill Shockley, but not to the details like you told us today. It's really inspirational. And it makes me actually very proud to be part of the Silicon Valley uh, after living in the East Coast for many years. Well, <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today with Professor Gibbons and another colleague 
an alum of Bell Labs, uh, James Jaffrey, the president and CEO of uh, IEEE. I'm honored to be standing before and celebrating the birthplace of Silicon Valley and all the technology, prosperity, and good it has brought to our lives. Just two weeks ago, I wrote a blog titled The Rebirth of Semiconductor Industry on Sammy's website. So today, I think we must celebrate two things, the birth of Silicon Valley and the rebirth of semiconductor industry. What a coincidence. This is really a very personal story to me and it even feels more personal after li listening to Professor Givens. Because as I started my career in Bell Labs, of course, not quite as long as uh, when William Shockley was there. But it was while at at and that William Shockley, along with Bardeen and Barten, was credited with inventing the solid state transistor. As Professor Gion mentioned, press release in 51, Bell Labs announced Shockley's invention of the junction transistor, and in 56, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in physics for his invention. And he came running to Silicon Valley here and started his dream, Shockley's semiconductor, as the birthplace of, uh, of Silicon Valley. It wasn't long before this technology was transferred to Stanford and the Tetris 8, you heard the stories, the Tetris 8, uh, sometimes we call it Rebellious 8, left to found Fairchild Semiconductor, which in turn became the mother of great majority of commercial semiconductor companies. <clears throat> I'll skip some of the history which Professor Givens has given, has already given us. But after working at Bell Labs, I went on to run semiconductor fabs for AT&T, then ran to Philips, now called as NXP, fabs globally and later led global foundries. As my career advanced, I was always grateful for the history of my at and roots and felt part of the DNA of the semiconductor industry. DNA that continued from Shockley Semiconductor Labs, opening its door right here almost 70 years ago. Today, as we celebrate the past, we also need to look to the future. As CEO of Semi, I'm fortunate at the very center of today's semiconductor industry and can clearly see the CH rebirth. And it's a story of rediscovery. An Amazon Echo wakes us up and answers questions about the weather and traffic. Google Maps tells us the way, best way to get to a meeting. Yelp finds the best nearby restaurants. It will find cuts also. A tweet now even informs us the latest change in government policy or foreign policy of USA. But semiconductors have been largely invisible hidden away under and inside a smart speaker, locked deep within a phone, buried in data centers and out of the view. We are living in a digital world where semiconductors have been taken for granted. But artificial intelligence, so-called AI, is changing everything. And it's bringing <coughs> semiconductors back into spotlight. With AI virtually every industry will be transformed and will make people's lives better and richer. Powering all this is and will continue to be semiconductors, AI's potential market of hundreds of zettabytes and trillions of dollars relies on new semiconductor architects, which require a widely innovative range of new materials, novel equipment, innovative design methodologies, to name few. To put it simply, to make AI work, we need new transistors, new chips, new hardware system, new compute platforms. It's again the age of hardware. Last year, our $400 billion worth of semiconductors were sold worldwide. Next year, it is forecasted sales will be so surpass half a trillion dollar. Now this is just the sales of ICs. Now don't forget, one simple startup, $1 trillion startup is Apple. 
is thanks to semiconductors. By 2030, I believe the IC sales will exceed $1 trillion. So I truly believe that this industry is on a, on a path to rebirth. You know, but four or five years ago, people started saying semi-industry is going on a maturity growth to be small single digit. Wrong. Last year we grew 14%. This year again we'll grow 10 to 12%. And I think we are back on this double digit, low double digit or high single digit growth. Now, but again, if William Shockley didn't do what he did, we would not be here today. <clears throat> At that time, it must have been unbelievably, unbelievably exciting. And I can tell from Professor Givens' uh, talk that how excited he was with when he started this and how excited he is that what he has contributed to this industry. But I can tell you that with the rebirth of semi-industry and the way semiconductors are building a digital economy and ushering the age of AI, it is the best time ever to be in, in the semi-industry. It's really my great fortune to, to be still involved in this industry and I salute the birthplace of Silicon Valley at this, the nucleus of the semi-industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajit. Our next presenter is <coughs> James Jeffries, President of Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the world's largest technical professional society. Jim is a retired AT&T and Lucent Technologies executive. He has worked directly with fiber lab, fiber optics with Bell Labs in the development of commercial fiber optic cable. Additional experience include innovative manufacturing development, competitive strengthening of distribution operations, and export of US built products. Just like SEMI over the years, IEEE members have supported this effort to what has brought us here today. Jim? Well, thank you, and uh, what a rich history we've just heard that leads us up to the actual dedication that we're here for today. Again, thank you all for attending and being a part of this very special IEEE milestone dedication. Uh, how many here are IEEE members? Okay, quite a few, that's great. Now, for those who may not be familiar with IEEE, we are the world's largest technical professional society. Our core purpose is to foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. Our members are vibrant and diverse engineers and technical professionals who are committed to elevating their professional image, uh, expanding their global networks, cooperating in their local communities and giving back to their local communities. Our nearly 420,000 members in 160 countries worldwide define technology state of the art. They are the leading edge of educating, collaborating, and innovating. They develop standards for the industry, and they leverage the power of technology to advance the human condition throughout the world. As the president of IEEE, it's my pleasure to join you today as we celebrate the historic significance of this site. The first company in the area founded to research and manufacture silicon-based semiconductors to the growth of the semiconductor industry and as a foundation of Silicon Valley. Although it was short-lived, Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory laid the groundbreaking work and the entrepreneurial spirit for the world-changing inventions that have come out of the valley over the last 60 years and are continuing today. And today we recognize the tremendous engineering talent that was working here and that went on to start a multitude of groundbreaking technology companies that can all trace their origins to this spot. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join today in this celebration. And I'm particularly honored for the efforts of uh, City of Mountain View Mayor, Lenny Siegel, the Computer History Museum, who is a frequent partner with IEEE, as well as my many colleagues from IEEE across Region 6 in the Western United States. 
Dedicating an IEEE milestone takes a tremendous amount of effort. And the members of our IEEE Santa Clara Valley section, which is one of the largest and most active sections in the world, are to be commended for their commitment of time, energy, expertise, and making this milestone a reality. So some of you may be asking, uh, what is an IEEE milestone? Well, the IEEE Milestones program honors significant technical accomplishments in electrical, electronic, and computer engineering and the associated sciences. Funded by donations to the IEEE Foundation, it's administered by the IEEE History Center, and the Milestone program recognizes great moments throughout our world's long history of technological innovation. The program was begun in 1983 as part of IEEE's own centennial celebration. Today's milestone is the 189th milestone dedicated around the world and the 14th here in the Santa Clara Valley section. Three centuries of technical progress are now marked by IEEE milestones around the world. They date back to the 18th century, the pioneering work of Benjamin Franklin electrical experiments in London, the invention of the battery by Alexander Volta in Italy. In the 19th century, they mark things such as the introduction of practical telegraphy by Pavel Schilling and Samuel Morris, the introduction of alternating current electrical power in the 19th century, and the pioneering work of Alexander Popov in wireless communications. In the 20th century, we mark such items as commercial radio broadcasts, the invention of the first wearable pacemaker, the compact disc, and more recently of Shaky, the world's first mobile intelligent robot developed in Menlo Park in 1972 and dedicated just last year. Today, we have the wonderful opportunity to commemorate a major milestone on technology's path of progress, the birthplace of Silicon Valley. This is not just a moment, a milestone in the history of technology, it is a milestone in modern electronics, computers, and entertainment as well. The scientists and the engineers who worked here and established the technical and cultural foundations for today's Silicon Valley. And it all started here, in this case I do mean here, in Silicon Valley just over 60 years ago. IEEE milestones helped to increase the public's awareness of the contributions to society made by electrical, electronics, and computer engineers and countless technologists as they have sought to advance technology to benefit humanity. Milestones are also a way for members of IEEE sections to take pride in their prof profession and its accomplishments. They demonstrate to the local community how engineers and scientists have contributed not only to that local community but also to the global community in building today's technologically advanced world. So it's my privilege to recognize those pioneering efforts and the people behind them. They serve as landmarks in the progress of technology and also the progress of civilization. I'm honored to be here as part of this celebration. I'd like to thank you again for joining us and I applaud the organizers for an extraordinary and inspirational program. Thank you. And so, and so it is now time to enshrine the birthplace of Silicon Valley as an IEEE milestone in electrical, electronic, and computer engineering. In order to do that, I'd like to read the citation, which will be on the plaque, which will be perfectly installed. So, uh, Dick, if you could join me uh, for the unveiling as I read the citation. The citation says, Birthplace of Silicon Valley, 1956. At this location, 391 San Antonio Road, the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory manufactured the first silicon devices of what became known as Silicon Valley. Some of the talented scientists and engineers initially employed there left to found their own companies, leading to the birth of the silicon electronics industry in this region. Hundreds of firms in electronics and computing can trace their origins back to Shockley Semiconductor.
Thank you very much. Uh, the IEEE uh, has also received a resolution here from Congressman, Congresswoman Zoe Lofkin, who is a representative from the 19th, I believe, Congressional District here in California. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically it's a resolution that commemorates the birthplace of Silicon Valley and a milestone in engineering and does hereby recognize the IEEE Santa Clara Valley section for commitment and dedication to advancement, to advancing technological innovations in our society on this 15th day of August, 2018. <laughs> See, it's now my pleasure to introduce a, a longtime friend and associate of mine, Stanley T. Myers, who is a semi emeritus semi-president for 16, 16 years. Stan has been, again, very helpful in our efforts here in organizing and creating this event. And uh, prior to semi, he held uh, numerous uh, executive management positions in the silicon industry. Stan has some guests that he'd like to introduce. Stan? Thank you very much, Andy. I uh, like the years he gave me. So to make sure it's in the record, 18 years at Monsanto. No, we didn't have Roundup then. <laughs> 17 years with Siltec, which we sold to Mitsubishi, and I worked there. And then the last 14, 15 years, is, and I retired when I was 46, with, uh, and, and, and the Jeep took over. Uh, I have an easy job here. You've heard everything. Excellent, excellent talks and impressive work. But you got to think real quickly, 70 years ago, right? An invention. 65 years ago, a startup it just happened to be in Silicon Valley. And with that startup came the, tre the leaving and the starting and the venture capital. And along the way, there's always a little forgotten part of that history. And I happen to be involved in that both as with uh, Mitsubishi and with uh, Simi. And that is called the international part of it. This industry began to grow and grow fast. People went broke, people became alcoholics, people did all kinds of things <laughs> in this frustration that you had in the valley. But in, uh, you know, in the end, there was something happening internationally, and it also was expanding, and it was developing relationships. And so we uh, wanted, uh, there's three or four guys that wanted to come here. One is, maybe some of you know, Pasquale Pisterio. Very important guy. You know why he's important? He's the only guy I ever known in the world that could take an Italian company and merge it with a, with a French company and make it successful. <laughs> and he did, SD Micro. Uh, we had a number of, of other people that uh, did that, uh, but in Japan, they began to methodically take a hold of the growth of the industry. Uh, and Toshiba, Nikon, Nikon, as you might want to call it, along with Pasquale. So there was three or four people that wanted to be here, and only one made it. And I have the pleasure of announcing uh, Kawanishi-san. We'd like to say a few words uh, from Toshiba. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations on the legendary Silicon Valley landmark as a location 
of the sight of the loves of Dr. Shokre, a father of world semiconductor industry. I am very honored to be invited to this memorable ceremony. I myself have exceeded the age of 89 years, but have involved in the industry for over 60 years. Semiconductor, a uh, life work for me, and its origin is di this Silicon Valley. I beat the United States for the first time in 1960. Since then, I have learned many things from the United States in various stages and met many great people. I had last year, 2017, was a milestone of the 70th anniversary of transistor, 60th anniversary of integrated circuit invention, and also 60th anniversary of Silicon Valley branch. This is correct or no? Anyway, I had this. It's truly amazing to know that the semiconductor industry, which was born in the United States and diffused to the world, we need to praise the achievement of the predecessors and to seek what they pursued. I think that the further development should be handed over to future generations. I would like to close my remarks with a lot of gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Has a gift for you. Oh, it? Right here. Well, I think that's the end of our presentations. Now comes the fun part. Uh, I'd like to, as you heard before, there were a lot of people that contributed to making this thing happen. In other words, this uh, monument to the semiconductor, the birthplace of Silicon Valley. But there are a couple of people that I'd like to point out and ask them to stand so everybody can recognize you afterwards. Uh, first of all, Kristen Stosh, Saul. Strahl, I'm sorry. Kristen Stahl. Kristen is the project manager, design and construction for Merlot and Geyer Partners. <clears throat> she was a member of the project uh, advisory committee since the day one and coordinated basically the work between the artist, the construction, and the developer. In addition, she also managed the design and construction of the various plaques we have uh, uh, on the wall on 391 and I think she was the co-author of the, or the author of this interactive kiosk that we have here in the plaza. Once again, thank you very much, Kristen. <laughs> uh, maybe some of you have seen these things sticking out of the sidewalk there on 391. Uh, those are the work of artists Mary White and Mickey Joe Sowell, please. <laughs> and you probably saw Terence earlier, but Terence is the creator of this Silicon Atom module that you see. <laughs> now all of them will be available here as you tour the, uh, tour the exhibits later on if you have any questions or comments. I'm sure they'll be happy to talk to you and answer your questions. Uh, I probably won't get the response that IEEE did, but uh, I'd like to know, could you raise hands of how many ex-Shotley employees are here in the audience today? 
Whoa. How many is that? Six is that's all I saw. How about Fairchild? There you go. Uh, in addition, I'd uh, also like to thank uh, the organizers for this specific event and we couldn't have done it without Liz Munger who's a senior property manager for Merlon Geyer Partners and I can't thank her enough for making this room available to us and providing some refreshments for us afterwards there so thank you very much. Yes. And some old colleagues if you will that worked with us on the, this project. Dick Terrence from IEEE. Dick was up here. Dick. Uh, Doug Fairman, who represents Computer History Museum, he's also been very, very helpful. And, yes, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> and also, my colleague, I like to point out, my colleague, an old friend from Chocolat Day, Jacques Baudouin, who's kind of in the Driving force. Uh, do we have some closing remarks here? Remarks from uh, Daniel Levin, the president and CEO of uh, president and CEO of Computer History Museum. But after his closing remarks, uh, you're all invited out in the patio area by the silicon structure, there's some refreshment and snacks courtesy of uh, Merle Gohn, Geyer Partners, and Shockley alumni. Daniel? Thank, thank you all very much. I will be very brief. It's a real honor to be here, and on behalf of the Computer History Museum, just all of the employees, Doug, who's been so terrific in helping this project along over the years, so many people have been thanked, so I will not repeat those things as part of my remarks. Um, the only thing I would like to say, just a few little anecdotes. Um, personally, I came here 42 years ago um, to come to work, and I moved onto that block between Arastradero and Charleston and lived on that street where Kirk's was. Um, so the more things changed for me, I stayed within a three mile radius. I've been in seven companies, starting at Sony, where I took the floppy disk into Apple, to Macintosh where I worked and I ended my career at Microsoft a little less than a year ago to take on the, if you will, the pleasure and the opportunity to be the CEO of the Computer History Museum to move things, we hope, to another level. Um, we're right up the street, as you know, um, and there's a program later this evening that is sold out, I'm sorry to say, but it's available live streamed on Facebook at 7 o'clock, thanks to LAM Research for sponsoring that program and the event tonight. I would say one other thing, and that I've had the pleasure of, of meeting many of the people uh, who have been honored today and commented on today over the years, um, from David Packard and, and Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore and others. So I've had a, a real, a real opportunity um, that I just, you know, today and Professor Gibbons, your talk just, I think you hit everybody right in the heart. There were so many interesting things that you said that most of us didn't know. Um, but I was present when Gordon Moore made some comments following um, one of the more current references to what's going on in the industry these days, and that is that software is eating the world. Most people have heard that comment these days. And he was very quick to say, but it must run on something. <laughs> so that's why we're here today, to celebrate the fact that without that, we would have nothing today, because we are surrounded, as you all know, by so many interesting things in the world as a result of semiconductors. And yes, software makes things work, but it's gotta run on something. So enjoy your evening and thanks for being here today.